You said you graduated from Puno. Right. And um, were you surfing before that? We were from surfing from 1935 when we moved into uh, Dad's centers. Mm -hmm. And of course, they didn't have the names then where they call tongs now off that wreck. We were surfing off of there. We're surfing where they call it old man's now and mm -hmm. all along the reef. And, and occasionally we'd paddle all, if the waves weren't good there, we'd paddle all the way down to Queen Surf at uh, Main Waikiki Beach, where the outrigger was in those days. And um, What board were you using in 35? At that particular time, I was using the 11 foot um, belts of redwood. And it, it, you know, it was surfed more or less in those days like a canoe because if you turned it on an angle to go out, the, the tail end would slide right out. It didn't mm -hmm. have any fin on it. So then after the war, when I bought this, I built the um, semi hollow redwood. So that came right after three and a half years away at war. Oh, okay. And by that time, when dad was asked to move out of the center home, he went up. If you know where Makalay Place is on the side of Diamond Head there, bought a beautiful three-story Spanish-style house that some dentist was scared to death. He was fleeing the islands, mm -hmm. sold to Dad for $37,500. Recently, we saw it sell, resell for $3.8 million. <laughs> <laughs> so I came back from the, the war, and before going back to college, um, went uh, the, the early uh, semi-hollow redwoods were being particularly developed by Waikiki surf guys like Georgie Downing and uh, think of the names of the other guys down there. So we went down to the lumber yard and put the 12 footers, two by four redwoods, light ones on one side, heavy on the other, one, hollowed them out, glued them together, shaped the whole thing and V'd the back end, really brought it down and V'd it. So you could turn the, the board very easily just by stepping back and swinging it. And then of course you ran forward to shoot the curl. Mm -hmm. And that worked out beautifully so that we were going down to um, Makaha in about 1946 and actually heard about it from the Waikiki Surf Club guys. They discovered Miley that doesn't break too often off of there. So a bunch of us that were aggressive surfers at the Outrigger Club loaded up our boards and didn't have the roads going out there that you have. Some of it was sand with grass growing in the middle. We went all along the coast, we saw where Miley was, but nothing was breaking, so we went all the way down to Yokohama. And on the way we saw what is now known as Makaha. We didn't know the name of it mm -hmm. then. So it looked like waves were forming, and so we stopped there and went out, and the waves got better and better as the tide came up. So we went back and raved everybody at the Outrigger Club, and pretty soon we were going out on weekends, camping safely, on the beach. There was just nobody there. You'd wake up in the morning and be the only ones in the surf. And um, and these were still the red, the hollow redwood boards? Yeah. Yeah. And around that time... Um, Who named some of the people that you were with? Can you remember anybody there? That Well, George Downing, of course, has been, yeah. been very prominent in surfing. Um, I'm trying to think of... Oh, gosh. Should have thought of this ahead of time. I'm trying to think of his name. Another Waikiki Surf Club guy. Wally Froyseth was he? Wally. Close? Wally was one of them. Yeah. Matter of fact, I got into a little trouble uh, temporarily with with Wally till we trucked it over. I had a friend at the club by the name of uh, uh, Mongoose John Mongoose Kreitz, uh -huh. and he knew uh, he knew what was his name again? Um, Wally. Wally Froises and his wife. So when it came time to shape my board, he said, well, he's got a stack of them down there. Let's go down and find a shape you like and put him, we'll outline it. Mm -hmm. Well, his wife was in the kitchen and she greeted us, but I guess when she reported it to him, he didn't know me and uh, resented the fact that we'd sort of taken his trademark shape there. So I'll never forget when I finished it, I was over at Queens one day and Georgie Downing paddled up and laughing away he heard about this story on this shape shape of your board got out in the water and looked looked it all over and said hey that's beautiful it should be very good so anyway we we got over that hump all right and uh, then around that time some of the California guys started coming in with their their um, foam fiberglass boards mm. and they were very maneuverable but I've found uh, in surfing, particularly at canoes, all the canoes and the, the big stand-up 14-footers go in like canoes to the left, 
but there's a nice curl going to the right for a good board. And so they were doing that, and I was doing that, and Georgie Downing was doing that. And in fact, Georgie and I saw so much of one another, he named his oldest son Keone Keith Downing, the next one's Kainoa Leith Downing. Ah. And I see him every now and again. <clears throat> we remember those days. But to be able to sleep overnight safely on the beach, not be bothered by anyone, and get out there and pick your way for yourself without a crowd of boards on it. I haven't been by there in years. I've been wondering with these light boards, there are so many of them all going for the same wave. I wonder whether they have to have courtesy and let the guy in the best part of the wave take it and the rest of them get off. But It's an issue. It is an issue. It's huh? an issue, yeah. So many of them. Yeah. But when I watch what they do now with those lightweight boards, it's sort of like skateboards. Yeah. You can see a break ahead and just race in anticipation up over the top of the break and down into the curl on the other yeah. side. Yeah. And of course, it, we didn't have leashes in those days because the boards were heavy and you got clubbed if we did, I guess. Right. So quite often, uh, if you lost your board, go all the way to the beach, some kid would pull it up on the sand and then yeah. we'd swim in. and. Yeah. But as you know, you can get pretty well wiped out down to the bottom of yeah, some, yeah. some of those big waves. <laughs> yeah. So did you ever finally own a foam board? Can you I, remember? I surfed on them. I never did own one. Um, try to remember. I, I guess, um, yeah, I think I, I just continued with that. Um, at Semi Hollow Redwood, and Until then of course year. I got married, and children started coming along, and I wasn't that free to go out there yeah. that much anymore. But um, good, so, good days, I'll tell you. Tell me a little bit more about Dad Center, because he's one of the names that really is pivotal in ocean. Uh, he and Duke were good friends. Uh, what, right. Did, were you related to him? Actually. His father was David Center, mm -hmm. and uh, they came from, of all things, Leith, Scotland, which is right next to Edinburgh. Uh -huh. So my mother was named Margaret Leith Center, yeah. and when my mother and dad started having children, Fred, come on and sit. Yeah. Brother Bob, being the oldest one, was named after my dad, Robert Alexander Anderson, Jr. Mm -hmm. Then they went to my mother's side and took the David from her father and then the leaf from in her name mm -hmm. and um, that's uh, but anyway that's where they came from in the 1860s or 70s I think somewhere around there mm -hmm. and he became very well regarded as a uh, sugar plantation manager and most of mother's centers were born on Maui um, dad center was born out in Kipahula which is he was, there was a plantation out there in those days. Mm -hmm. and his real name was George David Center, but as I mentioned before you started this procedure here with the camera, the reason he got the name Dad was his mother was born at Spreckelsville, Maui, where her father was the manager at Spreckelsville. And then he came out here, I would say probably about 18, mother was born, born in 1896, and I have a family picture, 1899, of Grandpa Center and his wife Flora and the six children all around and mother at age three standing on her father's lap. So if she was born in 1896, mm -hmm. it's 1899. Plantation in Waianae of all things. And if you go past um, the McDonald's store, there's a road that heads back in Mauka and eventually you come to these big palm trees Royal Palms lining the driveway like so many of these. We're talking about in Haleiwa? Out in Waianae. In wa oh, in Waianae, okay. And um, mm -hmm. you get way back in there and this was the manager's home. Mm -hmm. Well, I asked mother about those days and she said, of course, the only way to get to Honolulu was on the train in those days. Right. And it was going all the way around um, Kaena Point all the way to Haleiwa. Mm -hmm. So well, they didn't go in very often, but I think he died perhaps out in that, uh, at about that time, so that um, the oldest boy was George David Center, 
and he went to work at age 15, dropped out of school, mm. helped make money for the mother to buy the groceries. And then I think because of that position was like a dad, they started, kids started calling him dad, Senator. Mm. But when he got into swimming, um, they were holding swimming races in Honolulu Harbor, my mother told me back in those days. Right. And that as a young man, I think he was two years older than Duke, or two or three years older than Duke, he was just one hand slap behind Duke as a swimmer. Mm -hmm. And somehow he got into um, get being a coach, um, perhaps for some revolutionary type of training or something, I'm not too sure, so that he was selected to take the United States uh, swimming to the Olympics I think it was about 1934 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's when Duke went there and a lot of Hawaiian guys were breaking records. Right. So, yeah, he, of course, was one of the early watermen down at the old Outrigger Club on Waikiki Beach. And he was a, a great uncle because when we rented his home out there on the water <coughs> at Diamond Head, he, pre he presented us with a three-man koa canoe. Wow. For the three brothers <laughs> to go out and catch waves in. And we all remember very clearly one beautiful Saturday morning out there, what they call tongs now. Mm -hmm. Pretty steep, steep wave out there <clears throat> for surfboards, not mm -hmm. particularly good for canoes. Well, Brother Bob was probably 15, so he was steersman. I was three years younger, 12, and Alan would have been 10. So I was in the bow, Alan was in the center, and Bob was steering. And we were out this almost glassy day with just a light trade and a beautiful big swell starts coming. So we dig out and catch this thing. Pretty soon I realized sitting in the front, this canoe is on such an angle that I'm looking at the coral heads down there, mm -hmm. figuring this thing is not going to pull out. So I looked back up at Brother Bob and sure enough he was bailing off the steersman seat. So I went off the front seat and poor Brother Alan, age 10, was in the canoe when it hit and went over. It's a wonder we didn't br drown him out there. <laughs> so we broke all the outriggers off of it and whatnot, so we had to pull all the pieces together with a swamp canoe and swim it into our house. And dear old uncle, when we told him about it, he laughed and said, well, I guess you learned a lesson about that. And he had a uh, Japanese carpenter who was an expert with canoes and rebuilt it for us. Yeah. So today we had the pleasure of that wonderful location all the way up until World War II started. Yeah.